It's the end of June in 1984. TV is rerunning top comedies. The Billboard chart is filled with pure 80s magic. And the choices at the movies include ghosts, aliens, nerds, and a prince. This one is loaded with your favorite stuff, so sit back and get ready. This Week in the 80s starts now. So here we are in the middle of summer in 1984. This list of movies is unbelievable. Sometimes when I do these, I look at the list and I think to myself, I'm not really sure which one of these I would have gone to see if I was headed to the movies. Other times I look and think, I just probably would have seen them all. So this is one of those weeks where the movies just keep coming and you think that was at the same time as that and that was at the same time as that? How are you going to make a decision? Well, that's how you just end up going to the movies for five weekends in a row and just continually seeing great flicks. Now, at number 15 on the list this week was Conan the Destroyer. This is the follow-up to Conan the Barbarian. They kind of dumbed it down a bit. They made it a little more campy, a little less bloody, and also added in Grace Jones. It did better with the critics, but it did worse with the fans. Isn't that how it always is? Why do the critics give things like four and four stars and the fans are like, that movie sucked? I don't know what the hell the critics are doing. 14 on the list was Cheech and Chong's The Corsican Brothers. This is the last time that Cheech and Chong appeared together in a live action movie. Now, the interesting thing about this one, as opposed to pretty much every other Cheech and Chong anything, is there's no reference at all of smoke and pot in this movie. It's completely different. It's set up as a satire. It was such a bomb. They both decided they're not doing that again. At number 13 this week, we have Revenge of the Nerds. Up until this movie, if you're a nerd, that's bad news. They tried to make it a little bit cooler, and some might say it worked. In this movie, our hero is Louis Skolnick, played by Robert Carradine. Now, when he was cast as this character, Robert Carradine was cool. Like, this guy came from the Carradine family. His brother was Kung Fu. His father was iconic for 80 years. And all of a sudden, this guy's going from driving convertibles down the Sunset Strip and being one of the cool Carradines to playing Louis Skolnick with the nerd laugh and the panty raid going on. Just recently, they were talking with Ted McGinley about the character he played, Stan Gable. Stan Gable, of course, is the jerk. He's the quarterback. Everybody hates him from the nerd side. He's the good looking super stud and the nerds don't like him very much. Well, years and years later, they have a poll and it's on like an NFL channel or something like that, some sort of professional poll. And it's like the top 10 jerkiest quarterbacks ever. And Stan Gable ends up on the list. Tom Hanks gets us at number nine with bachelor party. Tom Hanks in a raunchy racy comedy at the beginning of his career, he was a little more risk-taking than he is now. It's a pretty funny movie. Number 11 was The Last Starfighter. I watched this one recently. The story holds up the graphics don't. This one came out seven or eight years after the original Star Wars. And the, the original Star Wars has some pretty awesome scenes with the spaceships and the explosions and all that because they used miniature models to film everything. With The Last Starfighter, they went almost completely with CGI, the computer-generated stuff, and it's very obvious. It definitely does not hold up to today's standards, despite the fact that Star Wars, which came out seven or eight years later, does hold up because it looks fantastic. The Last Starfighter is still a super fun 80s movie, and it'll keep you playing video games. At number 10, The Muppets Take Manhattan. There's always time to take an hour and a half out of your day and watch a Muppet movie. Here's one you should choose. It's fun, it's funny, and it's got a lot of extra Kermit in it too. At nine, we had Meatballs Part Two. This one should have been left on the cutting room floor. There's no Bill Murray. There's really no connection whatsoever to the original. It's a summer camp, and that's about it. The entire premise with the alien and the boxer wearing the dress, like there just really isn't much redeeming about this one. But I watched it a bunch of times anyway because it's a Meatballs movie, it's an 80s movie, and I'm a sucker for stupid stuff like that. At number eight, we have Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. This had already been in the theaters for 10 weeks, and it's still in the top 10. 
151 million dollars. I think it's the best Indiana Jones. The thing that I didn't know until recently was that this movie takes place before Raiders. The timeline to me, like, I mean, honestly, Raiders came out when I was nine. This came out when I was 11. So it's not like I'm going to put that together. And I just didn't really pay attention later. But now if you watch it again, you realize why they're approaching Dr. Jones at the college. He's already established because he already went on and saw Mola Ram rip some dude's heart out and dunk him in the lava. What a violent movie. I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. One of the worst movies you're going to find is at number seven, and that's Best Defense. Dudley Moore and Eddie Murphy. Or is it Dudley Moore and Eddie Murphy? Why do I say that? They made the movie with Dudley Moore and audiences hated it. It was boring. The story was weak. It's about a tank and a... Anyway, they hated it. So what do they do? They decide Eddie Murphy, who's a white hot in 1984, will help the movie out. So they shoot an entirely separate, basically an entirely separate movie with Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy and Dudley Moore never even meet on screen. It's basically two separate movies. Just they patched it together. They put it in the theaters. A whole bunch of people went to see it the first week, $14 million worth. Unfortunately, everybody told their friends that it was terrible and everybody stopped going. Do yourself a favor. Find this one. It's awful and it's awesome. At six, we had Never Ending Story. When you were growing up, did you want a Falcor? Because I know that if I could have had... A long slinky dog that can fly through the skies. I'm going to want two of them. At five, another amazing, pure 80s movie. We've got The Karate Kid. We've got Daniel San and Mr. Miyagi and Johnny Lawrence. As a kid, we were certainly pulling for Daniel San. But with the new Karate Kid information coming out and a new point of view kind of put on this, is Daniel San the bad guy? Is Johnny Lawrence just a victim of an out-of-town bully coming to his school? You know, Johnny was he was trying to hold on to his girlfriend. He went to the Halloween dance, all dressed up in his fun costume. And he was just smoking a bone in the bathroom before, of course, Daniel's son had to dump water all over him. It just goes on and on. And the more you watch it, maybe Daniel's son's the bad guy. Whether you're team Johnny or you're team Daniel, The Karate Kid's one of the greatest 80s movies of all time. I don't know a person that doesn't like The Karate Kid. Gremlins is at number four. This was a time when they were starting to really mix humor and horror. I never thought of this as a horror movie. It's super fun. I know it's violent. I mean, when they put that dude in the, in the microwave and another guy ends up in the blender, like that's bad news. This was so violent. This came out at the same time Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom came out. The MPAA was having a really hard time figuring out what to rate these movies because they didn't cross all the lines that they had to, to make an R, but they certainly were beyond a PG. So a couple of weeks after these two movies came out, PG 13 was created. That way we can add in more violence and still avoid the R rating. At number three, Disney re-released the jungle book. They were basically just using these movies as ATMs. They'd put them in, pull them out five years later, put them back in, VCRs weren't very prevalent, and certainly a lot of the movie stores weren't around yet, so this is the only way we'd be able to go to see them. At number two, it was Ghostbusters. My favorite story about Ghostbusters is the fact that Rick Moranis wasn't supposed to be in this movie. It was supposed to be John Candy. The problem was John Candy at the time, now he was in Stripes, he was in National Lampoons. He was well-known. He was from SCTV. He was kind of a big deal. But John Candy kind of thought he was a little bit bigger of a deal than John Candy actually was. So he was pushing to get the character that he was going to play as a main character instead of a secondary guy. He wanted to play the character of Lewis as a hardline, German, straightforward character included in the rest of the Ghostbusters gang. They didn't go for it. Ivan Reitman said, absolutely not. Instead, they gave it to Rick Moranis, who absolutely killed the role. At number one this week, it was Prince with Purple Rain. If somebody came to you and asked you for an 80s playlist, you could give them July of 1984 and send them on their way. This is a fantastic example of awesome 80s music. Yeah, we got a couple in there that aren't that great, but a lot of big time bands and songs that everybody knows. 
When you're done with this show, make sure you go to the playlist section and find this playlist. I already created it. It's there for you to hit play, hit shuffle, crank up, and share with your friends. Top 40, here we go. Number 40, Boys Do Fall in Love by Robin Gibb. Probably could have started this list at number 39. Nobody would have noticed. At number 39, though, She Bop by Cindy Lauper. This is one of the filthy 15 that Congress came down and said, those are bad songs. We shouldn't let people listen to those. But She Bop is one of her big time six or seven hits. This is off her first album, of course. She's so unusual. Number 38, 1098 by Face to Face, whatever that might be. 37, The Warrior by Scandal featuring Patti Smith. Now, back then, I think it was just Scandal. They added in the featuring Patti Smith part later. We mentioned Prince at Purple Rain. One of his future girlfriends is at number 36, Sheila E. with The Glamorous Life. 35, If This Is It by Huey Lewis in the News. Another one from Huey's sports album. What a fantastic record that is. 34, former frontman from Jay Giles. Peter Wolf has Lights Out. 33, Turn to You. This is a go-go song that does not stand out as one of their best. It was written about the guitarist's ex-boyfriend, Bob Welch. At 32, we've got Rock Me Tonight by Billy Squire. This was the one that they say ended his career. Billy Squire was kind of a badass. He had Stroke Me, Everybody Wants You, like Billy Squire kicked ass. And then he comes out with this video and he's dancing in his room and kind of writhing on the floor and it's super uncomfortable and it's, it's literally terrible. And that was it for Billy Squire. Make sure you check the playlist for this one. This, the song is great. Like this is a crank it up and, and sing along song, but man, you don't want to watch this video twice. It'll haunt you. 31 alibis by Sergio Mendez, 30 sexy girl from Glenn Fry. Next on the list is John Waits missing you. There's really not all that much interesting about this song. He played it. We liked it. We liked it more. We requested it and ended up on the charts. This one hit number one in a lot of different countries, including the U.S. Grace Slick and Jefferson Starship. Number 28 with No Way Out. There's no way out of that song except hitting the stop button. Another Huey Lewis song was at 27 with The Heart of Rock and Roll before he was back in time. The Power of Love is one of his big deal tunes. This is another one. The Heart of Rock and Roll. I remember when I was a kid, I was trying to figure out like, what is the heart of rock and roll? He's listening to all these cities. Which one is it? Turns out that it was just still beaten. I was trying to find st still beaten on a map. That's a true story. At 26, it's Eddie Grant. Nope, not Electric Avenue. This one's called Romancing the Stone. There's a movie of the similar name. Journey's front man left the name of the band and his bandmates behind. Steve Perry's at 25 with She's Mine. This is a love song that's not going to say bad things about journey i promised i wouldn't we're going to move on to number 24 at 24 wang chung with dance hall days everybody knows the everybody have fun tonight everybody wang chung tonight whatever the hell that's supposed to mean i think dance hall days is their best song it's fantastic it's a super fun video too don't forget in the 80s we had some pretty decent rock and roll pure rock and roll because at number 23 we have round and round by rat Love will find a way. Just give it time. 22, heaven helps the man. I'm free. Kenny Loggins. Kenny Loggins ends up on a lot of these charts. The more he ends up, the more I remember. I like that song, Danger Zone. At 21, this one brings me to MTV. I remember being a kid and watching MTV a lot. The first video I saw that I can remember seeing on MTV is that Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go by Wham. But this one is one that I really remember watching a lot on MTV as, as, a, as a child. Like, I mean, I'm 11 at this point and I'm watching Duran Duran and The Reflex. Eddie, Alex, Michael Anthony, and David give us number 20. That's Van Halen's Panama. Do yourself a favor. If you're ever in the car with me and I'm driving, don't put this song on the radio. If you do, we're gonna see how fast that car goes. I just can't help myself. 19, Corey Hart, sunglasses at night. You ever try wearing sunglasses at night? It's kind of a stupid idea. You can't see a damn thing. 18, let's get it slowed down a bit. Let's get a little bit of love in here. A little bit of Peebo Bryson, if ever you're in my arms again. 17, self-control, Laura Branigan. Laura Branigan had a few great songs. It's surprising she didn't have more. Her songs that are popular are really fantastic. The Cars were at number 16 with Magic. 
The Cars have a lot of great hits. They're one of those bands where you don't really stack them up and think they've got 15, 20 songs that you love. You don't really put them on a list of, they're one of my favorite bands. But when you start listening to music by The Cars, you realize, I like that song. I like that song. They sing this one. Hey, I like that song. At 15, we had Stuck On You by Lionel Richie. Lionel pulled away from his R&B side of things and gave us a little more country. Country, Lionel Richie, no joke, listen to it. It's sort of a country pop tune. It actually ended up on the Billboard country charts as well as this one. 14 was Dr. Doctor by the Thompson Twins. You know, there really aren't any twins involved in that band. There were three people in the band, not two. And legitimately, none of them look like each other. So what's that all about? The Thompson Twins were two characters in The Adventures of Tintin, an English comic strip. The whole idea never made any sense to us because we just saw the video and thought, where are the twins? I Can Dream About You by Dan Hartman is at number 13. Originally, it was on the Streets of Fire soundtrack and it was in the movie. When they do this in the movie, in the scene, it's not Dan Hartman singing it. It's somebody else's voice dubbed over to whoever actors they are have doing it. But when the record came out, they gave us Dan Hartman's version and it shot right up the charts. 12, Almost Paradise, the love theme from Footloose, Mike Reno and Ann Wilson. A lot of soundtrack stuff going on here, close to the top 10. We've got I Can Dream About You from Streets of Fire, Almost Paradise from Footloose, and at 11, Breaking, There's No Stopping Us by Ollie and Jerry. That's a background song. Don't spend too much time listening to that one. 10, Jump For My Love by the Pointer Sisters. Nine, What's Love Got To Do With It by Tina Turner. I think this was my introduction to Tina Turner as well. The whole like and Tina thing in the 60s and 70s, obviously that was beyond me. But in the early 80s, 84, mid 80s, I guess, Tina really was starting to come back in this new form. What's love got to do with it was a big reason behind that. ZZ Top with legs was at number eight. This is a good video. Elton John's sad songs say so much. At number seven, it's probably about the eighth take I've had to do with that because sad songs say so much. Sad songs say so much is not the easiest thing to rattle off when you're doing a breakdown like this. Elton John, number seven, sad songs say so much. Number six, Rod Stewart, infatuation. I don't really have anything to say about that song. I'm not going to bash Rod Stewart. It's not a bad song. It's just kind of one of those ones you put on in the background, then it plays. Number five, Billy Idol, Eyes Without a Face. This is a great song by Billy Idol. You got Mr. Rebel Yell. You got, he's got the snarl. He's got the tattoos. And he's kind of got a little bit of a love song going on here. But hey, it's a great song. This is off the album Rebel Yell. It might be my favorite one on here. Number four, State of Shock by the Jacksons. I turned this song off in 29 seconds. I turned it back on. I turned it off at 42 seconds. I have no idea what this one's doing in the top 2000, let alone the top five. It's going to be on the playlist. So go ahead and put it on and let me know how long you last before you just can't stand it and you turn it off. Number three, we have Dancing in the Dark by Bruce Springsteen. This is the Courtney Cox video. This is the one that made her career. I mean, if the boss pulled me out of the crowd and danced with me, would I have been on Friends? Possibly. Number two is Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr. Now, Ray Parker Jr. had some other songs, but this is the one that everybody knows. You know who knows it more than most others? Huey Lewis. Huey insisted that Ray Parker Jr. and company ripped off I Want a New Drug. You can put these two songs together and they're really, really similar. It's, it's surprising, especially the very beginning. It's almost note for note. I'm going to put a mashup of both of them on the playlist so you can check it out. The great thing about both of them is that they're both good songs. I don't care if one ripped off the other. I can sing them both and have a great time. At number one this week, matching the number one movie, we've got Prince with When Doves Cry. So this is off the Purple Rain album. I just found out when I was researching this week in the 80s that Purple Rain, the album, is a soundtrack. I don't know why I didn't put them together. I mean, there's a movie called Purple Rain. There's an album called Purple Rain. There's a song on the album called Purple Rain. So they're probably related. I just never considered it to be a soundtrack. When Doves Cry, that's probably one of the greatest soundtrack songs ever. Prince was awesome. This is such a great week to go back to the 80s. You should probably let your friends know by sharing this video with all of them. 
Also, don't forget to click the subscribe button, click the like button, and leave me a comment about something you like or don't like. And don't be upset because I'm wearing a Patriot shirt. This is an old school 80s Patriot shirt, and they were terrible then. So you'll be all right. It's Thursday night, July 26th, 1984. What are you watching on television? You're probably watching ABC because ABC is showing the Summer Olympics. The Summer Games were in Los Angeles this year, and we were captivated. Everybody loved Mary Lou Retton that summer. We knew about the scoring. We knew about the coaches. We knew the backgrounds. It was all about Mary Lou, the gymnastics routine, and the Olympics from 8 p.m. till 11 o'clock. But if you didn't want to watch the Olympics, that's okay. You had some really good choices on the other channels also. NBC had two hours of comedy for us. At 8 o'clock, we had Nell Carter and Gimme a Break. 8.30, Family Ties, Michael J. Fox as Alex P. Keaton, and also Justine Bateman. Well, Michael J. Fox wasn't playing Justine Bateman. Family Ties had Justine Bateman. You know what I mean. At 9 o'clock on NBC, it was Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Sam and Diane, Norm and Woody. Also, of course, Cliff Clavin. What a great show. At 9.30, NBC gave us Night Court. Now, I didn't see a lot of this when it was out originally, but I've watched a lot of it again. And man, that Harry Anderson was cool. Imagine having a, a judge with a personality like that. Not that I've ever stood in front of a judge, but imagine if you did something and had to stand in front of a judge and the guy behind the bench is doing magic tricks and cracking jokes with Bull the Bailiff. That'd be all right. CBS went the action route instead. So we've got Olympics on ABC. We've got comedy on NBC. Got to catch everybody else's attention somehow. So at eight o'clock on CBS, Magnum P.I., it was Tom Selleck. It was a Ferrari. It was the helicopter. That helicopter ended up becoming sort of a, a symbol of the show and almost a character in itself. It actually ended up leading to the creation of Airwolf. Magnum led us right into Simon and Simon. And on this night in particular, Simon and Simon was the most watched show of the evening. Now, that's surprising because there's a lot of big name shows on tonight. You'd think that Cheers would have been at the top or maybe Family Ties, but no, it was Simon and Simon. The 10 o'clock slot CBS gave us Knott's Landing for those who really needed that just quick bit of drama before they went off to bed. And on NBC, Daniel J. Trevanti and Hill Street Blues. I didn't watch a lot of it because obviously I was just a little kid and it's not like I'm up watching cop shows at 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. But I've watched some of it recently. That stands the test of time. It's the same stuff now as it was then. And the characters are fantastic. Have you seen the other shows? All the links below will bring you to whichever year from the 80s you're looking for. And I'll be there to tell you all about what went on in movies, music, and television. A couple other links down below as well are there for your amusement. Go ahead and take a look and see what I got for you. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you click the like button. Leave me a comment because I always respond. And I'll see you next time for this week in the 80s. There's really no, there's really no, there's really no connection to the original meatballs. Eddie Murphy and who the hell's in the movie with the MPA created the MPA. And in the back is my man called MPA. Don't do that. You could say to them, go listen to W9. What is W9? For me at that time, it would have been WHTT or probably, probably, probably is not a word. There's just nothing interesting about this song. It's just a good one. Next on the list was, nope, it still is. Before he was, dun, dun, what's that song? Dun, dun. Ah, dude. Power love. I'm so stupid. Journeys. 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 Don't forget in the 80s, we also had some pretty rocking, 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 rocking. This one, this one, this one, that one, this one, that one, this one, that one. I must say that a hundred times, Mr. White Wedding, the dude from Generation X. He's got the snarl. He's got the tattoos. He's got the spiky hair. And he's kind of got a little bit of a lug, lug. A lug. He's got a little bit of a lug. You're probably watching ABC because ABC... ABC, ABC, he it. 
we were all gymnastics experts. We knew about the grading, the grading. You get an F. 